Hello, everyone, and welcome to session number one of our course, Pray with a Purpose. We appreciate you tuning in online. This will be a course consisting of four sessions, and so they'll all be online the same way. And each week, just so we're clear, we will put some handouts out there on blog.dirkscorner.com if you want handouts or discussion questions to work with your group or in a mentoring situation, feel free to go out there and get the handouts. But however you participate, we do want you to take seriously this challenge to up our prayer game. Sometimes in these difficult situations, we start to ask very critical, hard questions about prayer. Why should we pray? Does prayer change things? So that's what this course is all about. We want to go into God's word and see if it can take us deeper, each one of us in a different way, deeper into our prayer life. And so that's the intention for these next four sessions. So before we begin the course on prayer, let's pray. Let's go to God. Father, we thank you so much for this opportunity to look into your word, to take a break from the push and shove of all the demands of life and focus on what matters to you, matters that you have addressed in your scriptures. And so, Father, we thank you for this vehicle of prayer, this gift that you've given to us to dialogue with you about your will and your ways. And we understand that in so many respects, we have so much to learn about this discipline. We're barely touching the surface about what you want to do through our dialogue. And so my prayer is that your spirit would work through your word and through your messenger to address our hearts and give us the encouragement we need to develop this discipline even further because prayer really does make a difference in who we are and how we are used in this world. And so, Father, we commit this time to you and ask your spirit to work. And we ask in the name of our Lord and Savior, your son, Jesus Christ. Amen. So we're going to attack the big question just to start off. It's a, it's a powerful question. Why should we pray? If we're going to invest time and energy in speaking to God and expect things from that dialogue with God, then we need to understand what is our motivation? What drives us to pray? And so I want to take just a top level look at that question this evening. And I want to start with a working definition. Well, we find this as the talk goes on, but just to get us started, let's think of prayer of a conversation with God about his ways in the world. When Jesus teaches us to pray, right near the beginning of his prayer, he starts with this statement or this request to the Father. He says, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. See, the goal is for heaven to come to earth. The kingdom in which God rules in heaven, we want him to rule the same way on earth. And so there is this conversation we have with God, the Father, about how his will is going to be implemented in this world. So let's break this down a little bit. One issue has to do with wills. This is the ongoing dilemma we face. God is in this business of bringing heaven to earth. God has a plan for this earth. God has a plan for our lives and for our families and for our communities. What is God's will? And so whatever that is, we're trying to figure that out and sort that out. But at the same time, we have a will. Here's what we would like to see happen. And oftentimes in our prayer, that's what we're doing. We would like this person to be healed, or we would like to get this job, or we would like this circumstance to work out in a particular way. And so in those prayers, we're talking about our will. And so right away then, we have this tension that needs to be resolved between what God wants, his will, and what we want, our will. Now that problem is also complicated. It's not just me as an individual. It's complicated by the fact that it's us as a people. In other words, there are multiple people talking to God about his will. And as we've learned over the history of this country and the history of our church and the history of Christianity in general, we're not always on the same page as a people. And so there's additional complexity here where we all have our personal will, and then we try to find a way, how are we going to do this together? What's the collective will? What are we going to do together to implement God's will on this earth? And so 
there's a, a tension there, a nexus of communication that has to happen between what God's will is, what our individual will is, and what our corporate will is. What are we going to do together? So there we have the problem. That is the context in which prayer takes place. This is why we need the dialogue with God to get on his page about his will, our will, and our collective will. Now here's the good news. Underneath, we all want the same thing. I would say that's true not just in the church, but I would say in the world. What we all want is heaven. That's the shared goal. If you think of heaven defined broadly, we think of no death, no suffering, no fear, no victims, peace in the world, blessing in the world. We want that place without evil, without all the effects of evil. We would like that all gone. We would like that land flowing with milk and honey. We would like the Garden of Eden back. And so all of us, whether we're talking about our individual will, that's what we want. I mean, think how often when we're praying, we want relief from pain for ourselves or someone else. We want relief from suffering. We want uh, clarity about where we should go to do the best thing. We're praying against the curses of this world and we're praying for the blessings, praying against conflict, praying, praying for peace. And so we want that heaven. And I would say people collectively want the same thing. One society after another, they're trying to set up heaven on earth. They're trying to figure out how to create a society in which there is no hurt, there is no damage, there is no oppression that people are taking care of. That's the goal in every good intention society. So I would say every normal person, now of course there are people out there that don't want this, they just want their own selfish gain. So those people obviously are wrong. <laughs> but most normal people, most good people, they just want heaven. They want that. Now here's the good news. That's what God wants too. God wants heaven to come to earth. Jesus says that in his prayer. He, he wants God to reign on earth as he does in heaven. That has been God's intention all the way along. He created a garden. We call it the Garden of Eden. Scriptures call it the Garden of Eden. It's where heaven happened on earth. But of course, through the sinful rebellion of humanity, we're cast out of that paradise into the world around. And much of human history ever since that point has been about restoring that garden. And the story of the whole deliverance of Abraham and the calling of Abraham into the land, this new promised land, the idea of a new land of God, a new land flowing with milk and honey. That's about restoring that garden. And the whole idea of a new kingdom of God built in the middle of this land where God's law reigned, where God's righteous king reigned, that's all about bringing heaven to earth. And so God has demonstrated throughout the history of his people, that's what he wants for us. And so when we enter into prayer, let's be clear, we have a shared goal. In our souls, we want heaven. God wants heaven for us. And so we're on the same page here about what we want and what we're asking for. But what's the problem? What's the tension then? Well, the problem is that we're not in heaven yet, are we? We would love to live in a world without sin and without evil and without all this pain, but the truth is we live in a world with all that. We have death and suffering and fear and victims and conflict, and we're living with the curse, not with the blessing. And so we're living in this broken world. We want heaven, but we're living in a world that obviously isn't heaven. So here's the great challenge for us as individuals, for us as a society, for us as a people of God. How do we get from here to there? It's a very simple question. But the problem is we have many different plans on how to get from here to there. Most of human history is about how to get from here to there. We want paradise, but we live in a broken place. And so the tension always comes up with, we all have our different plans to get from here to there. God has a plan to get from this place. We have our own plan, and there's the collective plan. So all that plays out in prayer. We're dialoguing with God because he, we know eventually he wants us to get to the place there is no death, but we're dealing with death right now. Death that comes too early to too many. 
suffering for no reason, suffering of innocent victims. These things are all around us, and so there's all these different plans about how we as a society, one political party has a different idea of a, di diff a different political agenda, all these different ideas of how we're gonna get to paradise. And so, again, this is the context for prayer. We all want the same thing, we all want heaven, but how do we get from here to there? There's different plans. Now, here's why there are different plans. Here's where the tension comes in, and I would say it happens on two levels. One has to do with timing, obviously. We all want heaven, and by the way, we'd like it right now. We'd like heaven to, to enter earth right now. We'd like the suffering to stop now, the pain to stop now, the oppression to stop now, the death to stop now. We would like all this to go away now. And part of the tension between us and God is that God seems to be working on a different clock because heaven as we know it, it's not here right now. And so there's always this tension of already and not yet. We know that Jesus brought the kingdom, but not the full implementation of the kingdom. That is, the full kingdom has not been revealed to everybody, so people are still living in darkness. People are still li living with the consequences of sin and guilt and, and failure. And so there's this tension. We would like it to all go away now. And of course, when it does all go away, when we get our way and all the pain disappears and all the suffering disappears, we will be in heaven because that's the only way that this is gonna happen across the board. The thing is, when we pray, we don't always think at that scale. We would like it to happen for us right now, but we, what we don't always take into consideration is this is a problem that's throughout the entire world. Do we want to solve the problem just for ourselves right now or just for our family right now or just for our community right now, just for our nation right now, or do we have this same desire for the whole world? See, that's the tension. We all want it right now, but God seems to be on a different clock because his agenda seems to be for the whole world, not just for us personally. And so the first tension point that we have when we pray is always this conflict between our will and God's will and how quickly that is going to be implemented how quickly heaven comes to earth, and how quickly we can get through this suffering so we can get to the peace. But underneath this tension over time, I think is the more basic tension, and that's about method. How is God doing this? How is he going to fix things? How is he going to get rid of pain and suffering? And we seem to have a different method in mind, a different plan in mind. And there are a number of ways where we could discuss this tension. I think probably the most basic way to discuss it has to do with this tension between law and grace. Uh, now that's gonna take a while to expound. That's gonna take a little bit of foundation work here for me to set the starting place for the argument. But I want you to stick with me because I think if we build this foundation stone, we're going to see why prayer is so important to the way God has chosen to do things. And that will give us a whole different perspective of how to enter into prayer. So give me a moment or two to explain, the, explain this uh, tension between law and grace. Now, law is discussed throughout the scriptures. So let me start with, first of all, the promise of law. Notice what God says to his people in Deuteronomy chapter four. He says, acknowledge and take to heart this day that the Lord is God in heaven above and on the earth below. So this idea that God, the Lord, he's, he's heaven, Lord of heaven and earth. So it's the same God ruling both. There is no other. Keep his decrees and commands, which I am giving you today, so that it may go well with you and your children after you, and that they may live long in the land the Lord your God gives you for all time. So. This is God's plan. Again, he wants heaven for his children. He wants heaven on earth for his children. And he's saying, all you have to do is follow my laws and keep my decrees and you will have heaven on earth. That's the promise. Now remember, this law that we're talking about is the law that he's giving to Moses in this book. 
Of all the countries, of all the societies that have set up law codes, see, this law code ought to be the very best, ought to be the very finest. I mean, this is the perfect law code for its time because it's given by God himself, word for word. What is that law? And so it's meant to be a perfect expression of what the world would look like if everyone lived according to law. Societies from the beginning of time have set up their own version of laws, what's right, what's wrong, what's acceptable, who needs to listen to whom, who has authority, what happens to bad guys, all that kind of stuff. They put it in law codes and society tries to work according to that. And the desire is at somehow that this would create the perfect society. So God enters that world where everybody's making up their own rules and their own laws about how this ought to go. And he gives a perfect law through Moses. And he says to this people, look, all you have to do is keep this law. If everybody marches according to this drum, you will have the perfect society. You will have heaven on earth. I will be Lord, I am Lord of heaven and earth. And you will see that the same kingdom of heaven will show itself on earth. All you have to do is follow this law. So there's a promise in law. If it's good law and it's done right and people live according to that law, we should have paradise, especially if this is God's law, his perfect law. But of course, that's the promise, but that's not the reality because there's also a problem with the law. Look at how Deuteronomy puts this. And again, I picked a couple verses here, but this theme weaves its way the whole way through the Old Testament and even into the New Testament. So these are just representative verses of a larger theme. But look what it says here in Deuteronomy chapter eight. It says, if you ever forget the Lord your God and follow other gods and worship and bow down to them, I will testify against you today that you will surely be destroyed like the nations the Lord destroyed before you, so you will be destroyed for not obeying the Lord your God. So here's the curse side, here's the problem with law. If we're going to live in a society dominated by God's righteousness and we're going to get the blessing, if we veer from that and don't obey that and don't take care of that, then the curse falls on us, destruction falls on us. See, that's the problem with a society that's totally law-based. If it's all about law and all about following the rules, the problem is people don't follow the rules. There's brokenness there. And when people don't follow the rules, good laws in God's community, that's what creates the brokenness. In fact, isn't that why laws are there in many cases to start with? It's because some people have chosen to disregard love, disregard personal space, disregard uh, what they need to do to take care of one another decided to put themselves first. And so there has to be laws as hedges built around that. See, if we're going to live according to law, then everything is based upon the fact that, that we keep the law and the future of our society, the future of our harmonious existence, the future of heaven on earth depends on our ability to keep the perfect law, let alone the imperfect laws that we see in the countries. If we can't keep God's perfect law, then we're not gonna have a perfect world. We're not going to have heaven on earth. Now, what does all this have to do with prayer? Uh, law has this promise and it has this problem, but what does that have to do with prayer? Well, here's the problem. Law from the beginning of time has yet to produce the perfect society, so we pray. Regardless of what country we live in, what state, what community, we're praying because, see, law has failed. We still experience suffering. We still experience injustice. We still experience pain and death. Law has failed, no matter how good the law has been. And this is one of the central lessons of the Old Testament story. I mean, here, God's people were given the express revelation of his will. They are given the perfect law. You couldn't have better law than this. And even with that perfect mirror of God's righteousness in front of them, they still veered to the left and the right. They still treated one another badly. They still chased after the gods of other nations. And so even with a perfect law in front of them, even with good kings in front of them many times, they went sideways. And so this is the problem with trying to bring heaven to earth just based upon rules. And we see that in our prayers. 
you know that you're dealing you're dealing with a society that's not working when you say things in your prayer like or at least you feel them like that's not fair it's not fair that a young man should die so early in his life it's not fair it's not fair that someone else should suffer from cancer when they're good people they've done great things and they're still getting cancer it's not fair that I did worked very hard and someone else got the credit. It's not fair that I put in an application and I have more uh, credentials than somebody else who got the job. It's just not fair. And so much of our prayer is crying out to God because this law world in which we live, it's just not fair, it hasn't worked out. And so we're pushing back against the fairness. But keep in mind, though, that sometimes that frustration with fairness, it, it goes into kind of despair. And we don't know what to do. So the second level of this disappointment with law and its ability to create heaven on earth is we start to despair. We don't know what to do anymore. We're at the end of our rope. We can't come up with the money for our rent. We can't deal with the pain anymore. We can't deal with the hurt and the disappointment. We feel overwhelmed because it's just not working. The system is not working. We're feeling neglected and lost in all of that. And even when we're trying to do good, sometimes we try to do good and we're in mission and we're seeking to alleviate the pain of the world. And sometimes the pain is just too big and the mountains are too big. As I often use the analogy, I feel like a teaspoon in the middle of an avalanche. You, how are you gonna fix this? You can get overwhelmed by all that because it's just not fair, it's not working, it gets desperate. And the other thing I would say in all this tension of law is that while sometimes we're asking for grace, or sometimes we're asking for law and the application of law, sometimes we are asking for grace because we're overwhelmed by something we did wrong. Somebody made a mistake, they made a bad judgment and they're having to pay way too much. They made a decision to sleep with the wrong person or to drive with one too many drinks or they made a decision and all of a sudden the system did kick in and they got lost somewhere and their payment is way over what seems appropriate. And then we're asking for grace, we're asking for forgiveness, we're asking to a break from the law. When people get into desperate financial situations, it makes them do desperate things, steal where they wouldn't steal before. And then we're looking for grace. People who violate uh, the laws of the land and find themselves in prison for long periods of time, we are, we're asking for grace. And so our belief in the law and our trust in the law is shaken. And so this is how this brokenness of this law-filled world starts to enter into our prayer life. Now I bring all this up because see, a lot of times when we go to prayer, we're still in this law mentality. We're crying out because it's just not fair. I mean, you read through the Psalms, that's normal. You read through the Psalms, David's doing that all the time. The Psalmists are doing that. Where is the justice here? And so in our souls, if we're going to find healing, we're trying to grapple with the fact that there is this broken world where the laws are not pure, and even if they are pure, people are not pure, and there's this brokenness. So what do we do about that? And so we're going to God with this idea that we've got to fix this. Somehow this has to take place. Somehow the laws have to be corrected and people have to be corrected so that we can get heaven on earth. So what do we have to admit then about this law? That in the end, law can only do so much. Law can and must address the symptoms, but it can't really cure the problem because the problem is broken human people. Bro broken human people make the laws and broken human people don't keep the laws, at least the way God wants them to be kept. Now let's be clear, laws are necessary, laws are important. I remember listening to a speech where Martin Luther King Jr. was making this point that some Christian pastors were telling him 
that not worry about the laws, just follow the Spirit. And he made the point to them, laws are still important because laws in this broken world, they keep people at bay. They make things right. So there should be good laws. They can and must address the symptoms. You've got to do what you can to protect the victims. And that's what laws are for, to protect the victims, to take care of those people out there. They're trying to leverage the system in order to enrich and empower themselves. No, we, we have to create a situation where people have an equal uh, access to what they need to survive and to prosper. And so laws are important. But let's be clear that laws by themselves will not cure the problem. We will not create the politi perfect political kingdom, the perfect political state. That's the whole lesson of the kingdom of God. I mean, they had the perfect law. They had God talking directly to the prophets. They had God talking directly to the kings. And even with God getting directly involved in the history of Israel, it was not a perfect nation. Kingdom by itself, law by itself, will not solve the problem. And so when we go into prayer, we have to understand that the solution, God's solution for all this, is not always through this law, implementing and applying law. There's got to be another way. God has got to be working on another dimension. And that's what prayer starts to teach us about. And it all comes down to this truth. Now, I've taken this text from Romans chapter 8. It is actually throughout Paul's letters. He's the most clear on this tension. It says, for what the law was powerless to do because it was weakened by the flesh, God did by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh to be a sin offering. See, God responds to this broken world in which he demonstrated over thousands of years that law by itself, government by itself, is not going to fix the brokenness in society. So what the law could not do, God did. Now the law, he says, will break, and here he's using the Jewish law as an example because it is the perfect law, but it applies to all law. It's weakened by the flesh, meaning human beings create these laws and sometimes they're wrong, but even God's perfect law, it's broken because people can't keep the law. They violate these laws of nature. You got to look at the laws of righteousness as, as kind of like the law of gravity. If you violate the law of gravity, you fall down. If you violate the spiritual laws that God has built into this spiritual universe, it will create brokenness. And so because human beings can't stay on that track, that's why brokenness is here. And it's weakness. It's not a lack of resolve. It's not a lack of willpower. It's a, it's a weakness. There's a fundamental brokenness there that won't allow them to keep the law to its perfection. So how does God respond to this? Does he give up on the world? Does he give up on broken people? Does he wipe us all out and start again? How does he fix this problem? Well, he did by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh to be a sin offering. See, something happens in Jesus coming as human being, coming in human flesh to address the problem of sin and to address the problem of broken human beings. And there's something God does through the sending of his son that begins to rebuild the people of God, not based upon law, but based upon grace. Grace becomes the foundation stone of the whole new way of life. It becomes a foundation stone of the whole new kingdom of God. And so let's look at why grace is this new starting place. And then when we get that established, we'll start to see how, what role that plays in our perspective on prayer. L look what grace does. Grace, first of all, it judges sin. Grace does not dismiss sin, and not at least grace provided through the death of Jesus. See, the death of Jesus says that sin is very important, its judgment is very important, that you can't get away with sin. Sin leads to death, that's just the way it works. And so Jesus takes on himself death as the consequence of sin, not for his own sin, of course he does not sin, he takes that on himself. And so what he's doing there is he's saying, listen, I'm paying for sin. It's not as though we get away scot-free. No, we don't get away. God, through his son, pays the penalty. 
Here's how this works out in real life. See, when someone sins against us, we can be mad because we want that person to be judged. But what Jesus is saying is it's already been judged and condemned and death sentence has already been pronounced in Jesus. He's already died for that sin. And for us, we can run around covering this guilt. It's not, but we don't have to carry that anymore because our sin has already been paid for. Jesus died a death for that sin. And so in the world of grace, it's not as if God says, well, never mind, no big deal. You messed up a little bit, let's keep going. No, God's righteous ways still prevail because sin is condemned, it is judged. Jesus took the, temp the, the uh, judgment on himself. So we don't take sin lightly, we just recognize God has solved it a different way. He sent his son to die on the cross for that. Which then means the next truth, that forgiveness is real. There's real forgiveness in that death. See, sometimes when we forgive anybody, you probably had this happen to you, right? They say you for, they forgive you, but they really don't. Out loud, they say you're forgiven, but then they bring it up every chance they can. Or you know that you're forgiven by God, but you just can't get past the fact that you failed. See, that's the law side of us pointing the finger and accusing it uh, us of having fallen short. But grace says, no, the forgiveness that Jesus offered is real because Jesus died for that. The price has already been paid. It's not made up. The same reason we can go to somebody who sins against us and we can say, look, it's not, that sin has been paid for. It, it, there's genuine basis for forgiveness here. God extends that forgiveness through his son to us and through us to others. So the forgiveness is real, it's healing forgiveness. It's not just words, it's, it's something that God did in fact in history. And so this new power of grace allows us to go into a broken world without the zeal to see everybody punished and judged because that's already been taken care of. We can go out with the power of forgiveness and give genuine forgiveness to a broken world and see people can begin to accept that forgiveness and begin to rebuild their life. So that means now that hope has a solid foundation. See, as we think about heaven on earth, sometimes it can sound a little pie in the sky like we're naive optimists. Someday it will get better. The sun will come up tomorrow, right? We could sing the song. We can always be this. There's some people just have that optimism that will always be brighter tomorrow. But what's that based on? See, by basing hope on the resurrection of Jesus, the death and resurrection of Jesus, you see, grace now says there's genuine cause for hope because sin has been dealt with. Sin has been paid for, forgiveness is real, and the resurrection of Jesus says life everlasting is in front of us. The kingdom of God is here. God is building his kingdom. He will reestablish it. All where human beings have failed, where human kings have failed, there's now the divine king, Jesus Christ himself, who came and paid the penalty and now is rebuilding us in the image of his, it, God is rebuilding us in the image of his son. The spirit is conforming us to the image of Christ. This is not just pie in the sky hope or fantasy. This is sure and certain hope. Jesus already proved that this is where we're going. The destiny is not in doubt. And so as we work for this kingdom, you see, because of grace, not because of our achievements, not because we kept the law, not because we have a good plan, not because we work harder than everybody else, but precisely because Jesus is leading us and Jesus is doing the building through us and through his spirit, see, then we have a solid foundation that we can move forward. And see, this is really the power of grace in the end because we're promised this Holy Spirit to come alongside of us, to comfort, to guide us, to empower us, to do the mission of God. We didn't earn that spirit, we don't deserve that spirit, it is an act of grace. So when you put this all together, you see what God is doing through the death of his son, this sin offering that he gives up. He is doing what law cannot do, he is doing what governments have not been able to do, what kingdoms have not been able to do. He is recreating a new people through grace, based upon forgiveness, based upon a hope that's sure and certain, based upon this power of the Holy Spirit who's in us to restore us and remake us. 
See, this is the context of how God is building his kingdom. And so when we pray now, this ought to be the dialogue that we're having. How can we get engaged in that? How can we understand how God is working through these circumstances to bring grace into the world? And that takes very concrete form. God is working through grace to bring heaven to earth. Remember, we started with this prayer, God, we, we want your will on earth as it is in heaven. We want heaven to come to earth. That's what we want. And God is saying, I'm doing that through grace. Not through law, I'm doing it through grace. What does that mean? Well, I've put a few things here. We could probably put a lot of things here, but just think about how powerfully God is doing this. He wants to solve the, peop- the problem by turning evil people into good people rather than simply condemning them. I mean, God could have, based on law, just came in and, wo- and wiped out everybody who sinned, including me, including you, including the whole world. He did that almost once in the flood. That's the story of the flood, but God saved one family as a prototype of what he would do through Abraham and later through Jesus. But see, God, instead of condemning people who fall short of the law, he does something much more powerful. He turns evil people into good people. Wow, how do you do that? Eventually now there is judgment, there is condemnation. We do have to have prisons. Some people don't get the the message, and so they refuse the treatment. But God tries first this redeeming treatment, this healing treatment, this saving treatment. And so his plan is, I'm not just going to condemn and put all the lawbreakers in jail. I'm going to turn evil people into good people through the power of my spirit. See, grace can do that. Grace has the power to do that. That's why we have to uh, get on board with God's plan. That's what God wants. That's that's how he's going to turn, uh, bring heaven to earth. He's going to turn evil people into good people through the power of his spirit. And then he turns broken people into whole people instead of allowing them to crumble, right? I mean, we said one of those prayers is, I can't take it anymore. I I can't deal with the pain. I can't deal with the neglect. I can't deal with the isolation. I can't deal with the challenges. I can't deal with the failure. There are all these reasons why we want to give up and give give in. But God says, I'm going to restore this world. I'm going to bring heaven to earth by taking those broken people, those discouraged people, and I'm going to make them into whole people. People who are broken by their own addictions, God said, I can heal that. I can make them whole again. So we're not prey to the slaves, to the addictions, and to our passions. God says, no, I can build those people new. I can make them into whole people. See, that's what God is about. That is how he's bringing heaven to earth. And then there's this dimension, too. It's not just about individuals, but notice, he creates families from people who were once enemies. Right? That's the whole story of the New Testament, how he takes Gentiles and Jewish people and creates new families of God. That which divided people based upon race, based upon culture, based upon religion, those differences that divided people, God said, no, I can take that and make them one new people, one family of God. See, grace does that. We're no longer judging each other based upon our race or our culture or our religion. We're, bas- we're now understanding that God intends to bring us all together as his new family. See, only grace can do that because we all start off at the same place. We all are totally dependent upon God to heal and restore us. Regardless of what our law is, regardless of what our standards are, we've fallen short. That's the whole argument in the first few chapters of Romans. We've all fallen short regardless of what the standard is. We don't live up to these moral laws that are built in us and are certainly built into the law of Moses. We don't live up to those. See, God says, I, it doesn't matter where you start. We're all failures here. But grace says, yes, but we can come together. We're all on the same foundation here. Salvation, saved by grace through faith. And then he takes these broken people that he's made whole. He takes this divided world which he has united. He's taken these evil people that he's made good people and now he creates a force out of them, a force for good in this world. He empowers those people now to go into a broken world and love and serve. See, that's where the power comes from. That's what grace does. 
rather than judging and condemning and separating, God now invests in these people and he says, I can change and I can bring heaven to earth by creating this army of people now empowered by my spirit to go into the world and bring this healing message of forgiveness and hope and power to live righteously. All that's there. See, that's God's plan. So we go back to that idea of, well, how are we going to get heaven to earth? And we have our ideas about how God's going to kill that person or judge that person or give us blessing or give us money or heal this person or heal that person. We all have our plans about how this is going to work. But God is saying, can I just be clear about the plan? This is what I'm trying to do. This is what I want to do. And so with this perspective now, when we enter into prayer, are we doing this? Are we participating in God's plan? And that's really what prayer is about. So why should we pray? Let's go back to our first question then. That's where, we, why should we pray? And I said, it's, it's a dialogue with God about his will and our will. So now I wanna tighten that up a little bit. That was our working definition. Now we can tighten that up and make it a little more specific. No, why should we pray? Because we've got to reconcile our plan with God's plan to bring heaven to earth. We all want heaven, but we want, the best way for this to work is for God's plan to work. He has the best plan. We of all people should agree that God's plan is the best plan. We won't always know the timing of it, but we know the purpose of it. We know the method of it. And so in our prayer, our goal and our desire as we talk about our plan and what we want to happen and what we want God to do, we've got to realize that God has already told us what he's seeking to do. He's trying to bring heaven to earth by teaching us about grace. We have to learn grace rather than judgment. See, part of the time here factor, see, we want it to happen now, but God has extended the time. He's not happening now. Why? Because he wants more people to come to repentance. He wants a larger family. He wants more people to find out. And it seems throughout history, he's always putting the date of judgment back and back and back and back and back because he wants to give people one more chance. Even the evil king of Israel, read through, read through that story. Time and time again, he defers judgment because he wants to give people one more chance. See, we're in time now. God has not made it all happen yet. For one reason, primarily it seems, he wants people to come to know him. He wants this message of grace to get out there. And so as long as there's a possibility that someone out there can find him, to find their heavenly father, to discover the power of grace, as long as that's out there, see, we're in this mode. We're supposed to be part of that solution. So when we pray, part of what we're learning is how do we become experts in grace? Because most of the time we're praying in that law mode, we're praying in that judgment mode. We want fairness, we want, we want condemnation, we want people to be judged, we want, get, we want what's coming to us. But God is saying, listen, I've chosen to work through grace, so how do we learn grace in this situation? How do we learn to apply the forgiveness that God already has in his son? How do we teach people to accept one another and love one another and embrace one another rather than condemning and separating one another. See, in our prayers for our nation, for example, are we praying grace or are we praying judgment? God has already made it clear he wants to pray grace. He's working through grace. He'll judge in his time and in his way, but right now he wants grace for the world. And what are we doing to bring hope into this situation? You know, oftentimes when I deal with folks that are in a hopeless situation, they're in terminal cancer or somebody they love just passed away and you go in there and I don't have a lot of answers. I don't know why God allowed this have to happen now to this person who's innocent or too young or whatever. I don't have all those answers. But what I can say with assurance is I have this answer. I know the one who has the answers. And I keep going back to the same truth that this Jesus Christ who, who died the most unjust death, a young man who did nothing wrong, died on a cross in his early 30s because of unjust laws and unjust governments and unjust religious leaders, condemned to hang on a cross and mob mentality, all the things that are wrong with society, he died on a cross and God turned that unjust situation into the forgiveness of all people. 
And I look at that situation and I realize there is always hope rather than despair. All the injustice that happened on the cross turned into the resurrection of Jesus Christ, this fact upon which our hope is based. And so while I cannot explain all the injustice in the world, we can come back and we can explain that there is hope, there is reason not to give up, there is reason not to give in, for Jesus Christ himself shows us that there is life after death, there is life everlasting, full, abundant, rich life in him. We no longer need to fear death or suffering or pain because he lived through it and he offers that everlasting resurrection to us as a free gift. Which means now we can go into the world and we have to learn faith rather than fear and doubt. You know, whenever I teach the book of Psalms, I tell people that you read through the Psalms and you get what's starting to happen. Those are just prayers. And it's always a matter of, it's always a journey from despair to hope. As you read through it, it's always a journey. Somewhere along the line, they're in their despair mode or in the hope mode and the rejoicing and the praise mode. See, the circumstances in life don't change. What changes is the perspective that God is still sovereign, that God is still at work. And so rather than entering this broken world that is filled with so much injustice and pain and suffering, we, op we enter this world with faith. And so part of that dialogue with God when we're praying with him is, God, I need to learn faith. I need to go from that journey from despair and lament to, to hope and praise. I, I need to learn faith in the God, not faith that God is going to do things my way, but faith in a God who always does things his way because his way is always the right way. And so our faith is in a person, not in an agenda, not in a plan, not in a legal system. Our faith is in a person who has convinced us and proven to us over and over through the centuries that he loves us and he wants heaven for us. And so in our dialogue with God, we're, we're learning faith in this God. And also in that dialogue with God, we're learning righteousness, righteousness rather than rebellion. See, here's the other part of God's kingdom. He's, he does not save us from sin in order so that we can indulge in sin. He does not just take away the death penalty and then allow us to stay in the mess. No, the whole reason for rescuing us is to teach us to obey his righteous ways because the spiritual laws still apply. Blessing comes when all the people live according to his way. And so he's creating this new community, this new community of wills, that's supposed to be bent to his will. And what he wants to do is say to the world that look what happens when a group of people who collectively bend their will to God's will, live the way God wants to, live, follow his commands, speak honestly to one another, stay faithful to the brides of their youth. When we live in that community, what does it say to the world? See, God, that was God's plan for his people all the way along. He wants them to be a light to the nations. See, if you actually live God's righteous life, it does make a difference in community. And so he wants to purify us, not just to rescue us so that we can keep sinning until he comes back. No, he wants to change us into his people. And here's the thing, we don't have to do it ourselves. We don't have to be perfect. He's not trying to, to tell us we have to be perfect overnight. He's gonna take us to perfection in his day and in his time. And so what we should be learning through all this process of prayer is, God, make me a more righteous person. See if there be any wicked way in me. Lead me into the life everlasting. See, that's the prayer of the psalmist. So in our prayers, what are we doing to grapple with God's way of doing things in grace? How are we learning grace, learning hope, learning faith, learning righteousness? See, instead of just going to God and say, gimme, 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 because I want, 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 can we... Pour out to God our desires, but understand that through all of this, he's trying to teach us grace because grace is the powerful thing that will save us and save our world. And so this then becomes our conclusion. Why should we pray? Because we need to reconcile our plan with God's plan to bring heaven to earth. That's what really matters. And our example here, our supreme example here is Jesus himself. Father, if you are willing, take this cup from me, yet not my will, but yours be done. Now, over the next few weeks, we're going to talk about the importance of our will. It's not as if God doesn't care about what we want and what our need. He invites us to come and share our pain and share our requests and share our desires. That's part of the dialogue. Our input is important, and we're going to 
talk about that in the weeks to come. But as we start off, let's get one thing clear. As we pour out our desires, let's understand that in the end, God's ways are the best ways. And Jesus makes that clear. Even Jesus, who never did anything wrong, here expresses his will. His will is, I'd rather not go through this. But, Father, your will be done. I'm sure deep in our souls, we, sometimes we come to that place where we'd rather not do this anymore. It's too hard, it's too painful, there's too many uncertainties, there's too many disappointments, we'd rather not do this anymore. Can this cup pass from me? Can I just get to heaven now? But the Father, through Jesus, says, but I want the Father's will. Because, see, the Father wants for me what I want for me, and that's heaven but he also wants heaven for a lot of other people. And while we're here right now, he wants to teach us grace and teach us faith and teach us hope so that we can be lights to a world that's looking for heaven too. They just don't know where to find it. They're still looking in law. They're still looking in effort. They're still looking in all the wrong places. But God has revealed the way through Jesus and he says, can you learn that way? Can you be that model? See, if that should be the impetus and the motivation for our prayer, That's why we must pray, so that heaven comes to earth, not our way, but God's way. And we wanna be on board with his way. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the wisdom of your scriptures. Thank you for this truth. We stand in awe of your grace and your mercy that revealed these truths to us, that haven't that hasn't kept us, you haven't kept us in the dark. You you provide the light through your truth to tell us why we need to keep going in this broken world, to give us this pathway of grace through your Son. May we become living experts in this truth so that a broken world who's looking for the answers in all the wrong places may find them in the place that you provide, in the person you provide, your Son. And in his name we pray, amen.